Welcome to Worship with the Unitarian Universalist Community of Charlotte. I'm Eve Stevens. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am one of the ministers serving this congregation. In the Quran, the holy scripture of the Islamic faith, chapter 81 describes the cataclysmic end of days. This chapter paints a picture of what will happen when the day of judgment comes, when this world gives way and paradise prevails. The title of this chapter in the Quran in one English translation is the overthrowing the overthrowing. Verses 1 through 13 read, When the sun is folded up, and when the stars darken, when the mountains shall be set in motion, and when the pregnant camels shall be neglected, when the wild beasts shall be herded together, and when the seas boil over, and when the souls are reunited, and when the girl child buried alive is asked, for what crime was she killed? When the records are made public, when the sky is peeled away, when the fire is set ablaze, when paradise is brought near. In the Islamic telling on this day of judgment, justice will be sought for the girl child. Though voiceless in this world on that day, she will speak and Allah will listen. It will be her perspective that is of most interest to God. It is the world that does not value the life of this girl child that will be overthrown. It's this order of things that keeps her from living that will end. On the day of judgment, it will be her side of the story that the Almighty will seek and trust. This flipping of the script, this turning of the tables, is one of the signs that will reveal the beginning of a new and holy order of things. It is hard to imagine an entirely new order of things. It's hard to imagine a post-patriarchal world, a world without sexism and misogyny, a world in which people of all genders are no longer judged, evaluated, valued by the standards of patriarchy. Tomorrow is International Women's Day. Among other things, International Women's Day is an opportunity to challenge the patriarchal imagination of what makes a woman a woman. It's a chance to challenge the idea that women can be simplified into one predictable uniform category, that all women think and act alike, that all women desire the same things. Today, we will welcome Rose Hamid as a guest in our virtual pulpit. As a Muslim American woman, Rose often finds herself navigating the intersection of Islamophobia and patriarchy. Today, we are honored to have Rose with us to share her perspective as we celebrate International Women's Day. Welcome 
members and guests. It's good to be together this morning. Now head to our public Facebook page and greet one another in the comments section underneath today's welcome message. Teach our spirits not to fear. Hold us in your steady mercy, Lady of the Turning Year. Sister of the evening starlight, in the falling shadow stay. Here among us till the far light of tomorrow's dawning ray. Hold us in your steady mercy, Lady of the turning day. Mother of the generations, in whose love all life is worth, everlasting celebrations bring our labors safe to birth hold us in your steady mercy lady of the turning earth goddess of all times progression stand with us when we engage hands and Hearts to wind oppression, writing history's fairer page. Hold us in your steady mercy, Lady of the Turning Age. We light this chalice, symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith. May its flame guide us in our collective struggle toward liberation, seeking freedom from the oppressions that keep us from one another's full humanity. This light burns with gratitude for all the women who have shown us the way.
Good morning, Rose. Good morning, E. It's so good to see your face on this. <laughs> Starting and I was going to say January morning and it's not, and it's best not to say because it'll be different later. Yeah. People know we pre-record, but still. Okay, I'm going to try again. Here we go. Okay. Good morning, Rose. Good morning, Eve. So good to see you. It's so great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. It'd be even more fun if we could get together and work on this in person, but I'm still just so grateful you said yes, and we get to have you at a virtual a guest in our virtual pulpit um, this morning. <laughs> So I don't know if you remember, to my recollection, we met for the first time um, following a MECMIN interfaith Thanksgiving service, oh, yeah. tea and cookies afterward. Um, and But we know each other better now because we both serve on the CMS uh, Interfaith Advisory Council to the school superintendent. So we get to see each other through those meetings and book studies, everything else. So I was hoping um, just to let the congregation have a chance to get to know you a little bit um, before we get to hear you speak. Um, and so I'm wondering, you didn't grow up in Charlotte, is that right? Correct. I, um, I was actually born in Buffalo, New York, and I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. Not that there's a big difference between those. <laughs> it was up there in the northern tundra. And uh, we moved, I moved to Charlotte in 1987. So I'm almost a Charlottean, I think. It's that counts. That really counts. <laughs> Over 30 years, I think you're, that counts. And were you always Muslim? No, actually, uh, my mother is from Barranquilla, Colombia, and she is Catholic. My father is Palestinian, and he was Muslim. But uh, when they got married and came to um, America, they... Um, we ended up, uh, it's a long, long, much longer story, but I ended up, we ended up, um, as the younger or the older children, we um, ended up in the Catholic tradition following my mother's tradition. Very good. And I know we'll get to hear a little bit more in the service. So, and there are a number of things I just wanted people to know that you've been involved in, in the community. And there's a lot, but I'm just gonna name a few things. Um, you're the co-founder and president of the Muslim Women of the Carolinas, and um, that's a local organization whose mission is to bring together the diverse Muslim women around the area and get together to know each other better and do good works. I've enjoyed learning about that. And I know you've also served on the boards of the Community Building Initiative and uh, the MECMIN um, Interfaith Board. And a quick Google will tell you um, that Rose is also a frequent columnist for the Charlotte Observer and HuffPost. And it seems you write mostly about your experience as a Muslim American woman. And uh, I have to bring this up um, in, you probably know what I'm gonna say, in 2016, <laughs> Um, you stood in silent protest at a Trump rally and you became kind of a local celebrity. So I just wanted to ask you um, what that experience was like and what the response was for other people there. Well, that um, certainly did not turn out the way we had planned it. There was, there was a group of people who I had gone with. They had, they had been uh, doing the same type of thing. We're standing in silent protest against the concept of hate speech. And they would they would do that at Trump rallies, which they had many occasions to do that. And then they would just basically would normally just get escorted out and that was the end of it. But um, I think because I just happened to position myself directly behind him and I was wearing hijab, I think people were more attracted to that aspect of it. Uh, one of the big misconceptions is that people think that I was just escorted out just because I was Muslim. Um, and that wasn't the case. We were actually standing in silent protest. There was a group of us. And the thing that I took away from that whole experience 
was that before, um, before he came on and started talking, people were cordial to me. Um, of course, they probably thought I was a Trump supporter, so they were happy <laughs> to see a Muslim Trump supporter, but it wasn't, they weren't unkind to me because I was Muslim. And what I saw happen change quickly was when he started talking um, about Muslims coming to America to kill Americans and that they hate America, that's when things changed and got ugly. And that kind of exemplified the reason that we were that we were there was to protest against the concept of hate speech because of what it could do to communities or what, what, how it could, it, it could, you could turn like a rabid mob um, yeah. against somebody. So the aftermath of that was that we um, I decided that it was important to try to reach out to people who probably haven't had a chance to meet Muslims. So I um, actually created these flowers <laughs> We passed out at the uh, Republican convention in Cleveland, and I put a website on there so people could, um, could, could look up information about Islam and Muslims. So I think that we put that on the screen there for people, but it's salam, I come in peace, dot love, and it's a resource page for folks to go to and find out um, frequently asked questions about, about Islam and Muslims. That is a wonderful resource to have. Um, and we're very lucky to have you in the Charlotte community. You're such a warm, welcoming presence. And I so enjoy our conversations. Um, and I'm just delighted that you said yes to being our guest this morning. Um, and I hope you too, Rose, will go to our public Facebook page and members and guests watching you should head there as well um, to welcome Rose Hamid yourself. Um, and Rose, looking forward to the service. And thank you again. Thank you so much for having me here. It's really, it really is an honor to be here. And I really appreciate the invitation. Thank you so much. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين انعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين Some of my earliest understandings about womanhood came from my Catholic upbringing. 
I remember the story of Adam and Eve. My recollection is that the two of them were living in paradise. God told them not to eat from a particular tree. Satan shows up and he ends up enticing Eve to eat from the tree first. And then she, using her feminine wiles, convinces Adam to eat from the tree as well, thereby committing the first sin. And in committing this first sin, there is this um, separation between Adam and Eve and God. And by um, the creation of this concept of original sin, all of humanity is then barred from having a direct personal relationship with God. This was something that I thought was a great injustice. I remember my second grade self asking the nuns why it was that we had to suffer the consequences of the actions of somebody who um, we didn't have any responsibility for. And I was told that I needed to stop asking questions and to just believe things on faith. The other part of the story that troubled me was uh, the ramifications that Eve had to encounter. And if you look at humanity or the stories of, of this Eve story, it is what um, ends up causing a lot of the misogynistic ideals that people use to um, uh, treat women lesser than. So there's this notion that women, that Eve is this temptress, that she is the one who's responsible for the downfall of humanity. Um, there's even this idea that that um, the, pang, the pains of childbirth are a punishment for uh, what Eve had done. And also there was discussions as to whether women could even enter into paradise. So all of these things um, were kind of based on that Eve story of Eve as the temptress story. Um, for this and many reasons, I ended up leaving the church about the time I was 13. Um, there was a, I had a big mistrust of organized religion. I had the sense that people were using, people in power were using religion in an effort to keep themselves in power and to pit people against each other. So I didn't really have much use for organized religion. Um, when I hit my mid-20s and I started my family, I realized I wanted to find something to teach them. And so I started searching and I learned about the religion of Islam. And in the story of Adam and Eve, that was my light bulb moment where I thought, you know, this is what, um, the, and it was answering questions that I had growing up. For uh, Muslims, we believe that the Quran, which is the, our holy book, was revealed to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, from the years 610 to 632 um, in the Common Era. So during that time, the messages that he received were memorized as well as written down. So these are the same exact words that have been preserved throughout time. We also get our understandings from the Hadith, which is the sayings of Prophet Muhammad, things that he said that were recorded meticulously and passed on. Also the Sunnah, which is the, the ways that he behaved and the example that he set for how we should treat um, people and what we should do in our day-to-day -day life. So in the Quran, the story of Adam and Eve is very similar to the one I had remembered. They were uh, both living, they were living in paradise. They were told not to eat from the tree and then Satan shows up. One of the big differences is that in the Quranic version, the, um, they realize what they've done. Adam and Eve realized that they had sinned against God and they asked God for forgiveness. In that moment, God forgave them. And that was monumental to me, that concept that God is the most giving, the most merciful, the most kind. These are our attributes that we give to God. And that concept of mercy and forgiveness is one that really resonated with me. So he forgave them. However, they had to suffer the consequences of their actions, but that connection with God was never broken. As Muslims, we don't believe in that concept of original sin. Um, the other big thing for me was the fact that it says the two of them disobeyed God. It wasn't Eve that had more responsibility for it. It wasn't Eve as a temptress. It was the two of them that disobeyed God. So that concept of Eve as being responsible does not exist in Islamic doctrine. Um, that concept of Eve um, having to suffer and all women having to being punished by suffering the pains of childbirth is also something that is not in Islamic doctrine. As a matter of fact, there is a verse um, in chapter 46, verse 15, that says, 
and we have enjoined on man to be dutiful and kind to his parents. His mother bears him with hardship and she brings him forth with hardship. So there's an acknowledgement that there is pain in childbirth, but it's not a punishment. It's, it's seen as a way that women should be honored. It's something that women should be um, held in high regard for. As a matter of fact, there is a hadith or a saying of the prophet that says, there was a man who came to him who um, asked him, who is most deserving of my fine treatment? And the prophet said, your mother. And the man asked again, who after that? And he said, your mother. And he asked, and who after that? And he said, your mother for the third time. And then the fourth time when he asked, who, who should I honor after that? And he said, your father. So to, to Muslims, that is a really strong statement of how women and um, in particular mothers should be treated. And it's something that is very different from what I remember growing up. So there is a, a big difference in that Adam and Eve story and the ramifications from it. When I was learning about Islam, one of the things that was hard for me to come to terms with was the concept of hijab or the head covering. To me, it seemed like it was something that some man had made up wanting to keep women subjugated and keep them in their control. So it wasn't until much later that I really started to learn about um, the meaning of the wearing of hijab and the covering up. I realized that covering was something that God had directed us to do. Actually, it's for both men and women. We are both required to lower our gaze, which means to not stare longingly into people of the opposite gender and to dress modestly. Um, you're required to dress modestly when you're in the company of people who are not your direct family members. To me, wearing hijab in public is a form of worship. It's something that I'm saying that I'm doing this because I want to do what God has asked me to do. It's a form of worship. It's also something that to me is a protection. It's a statement that my value and my worth to society should not be based on my sexual um, attributes or my physical attributes, but on who I am as a person. Um, while there are some cultures where women are forced to wear hijab of some type of kind of cultural dress, the majority of Muslim, the majority of women who identify as Muslim actually don't wear hijab. Um, there are some pious women who acknowledge that it's something God has directed women to do, but for whatever reason, they don't wear it. And for some, even in Muslim majority countries, wearing hijab is forbidden. Um, then there are those who deny that it's a requirement at all. For all of these women, it's important to remember that God is the judge, and we as Muslims cannot condone those who have different understandings of the whole hijab concept. Um, there are things that women cannot control about our looks, but the choices we make and how we dress and present ourselves does send a message. Sometimes that message is, I'm a devout yet stylish Muslim, or it could be, I just dropped the kids off at work and I'm barely making it, I'm sorry, I just dropped the kids off at school and I'm barely making it to work on time. Um, I may not fit your de definition of what beauty is, but I am fully capable of doing my job regardless of how I'm dressed. Um, it is really tiresome when so many people are dictating to women what they think is acceptable for women to wear. So it's ridiculous that in some places in the world, women are not allowed to cover up at the beach. They're not allowed to wear Islamic clothing at the beach. They're literally made to disrobe in, or leave, leave the beach. And then on the other hand, there's places where even a little bit of hair showing is considered something that uh, women are condemned for. Women should be free to wear what they want according to their beliefs without being harassed for their choices. It's normal to make assumptions about others based on how they choose to dress. It is normal. But even if one doesn't like how a woman dresses, whether it's stylishly modest or frumpy or even scantily clad, women should be valued for their contributions and treated with civility.
The verse that was just played comes from the Holy Quran, our holy book, which we believe contains the exact words of God preserved from the time that it was revealed. Um, other religious texts use the term man to refer to humankind. However, the Quran is very specific about using the term men and women. I believe that's because women had been treated pretty poorly up until that time and still are. But um, Islam grants women uh, rights that up until recently have been uh, granted to women in the West. Some uh, may point out, well, it seems like there's a lot of women in Muslim majority countries who are not being treated very well. And the reality is that that's true for women all over the world. And it's not though because of Islam, it's in spite of Islam that women are treated poorly. People use their cultural norms um, above what their religion tells them. So that is one of the reasons why there's so many um, women who are suffering around the world. But um, actually Islam grants women rights, just for example, the right to live, which is something that seems fairly basic. But up until this time, up until the revelations, women, if, if somebody had um, a baby girl, people were really disappointed and they would actually bury them or kill them in some form. So there is very explicit language in the Quran that says that that is not permitted. And it's, uh, it goes to show how prevalent that practice was for it to have to be mentioned in the Quran that that's something that you're not supposed to be doing. Um, if, if Islam also gives women the right to education. Not just women, both men and women are required to get an education and not just in religious matters as well either. It's um, for secular matters also. So that's something that is granted to, to women or expressed specifically to women. Women have the right to choose which spouse they marry. And um, to, at, they actually also have the right to divorce, to initiate a divorce, something that a lot of religions don't permit. And Muslim women generally keep their family name, their father's name. They don't change the name to their husband's name. So these are some things that within the family dynamic that women have the right to. Also, women have the right to be cared for. And what that means is that the men in the household have a responsibility to make sure that the women in their household have the necessities that they need in general in everyday life. This extends not just to the wife, but to all women in their um, immediate family. They are required to make sure that those women have those, those um, necessities of life. So aside from getting those, um, that guarantee of that type of assurance, women also have the right to work. And the thing about that is that women, if women decide to work or if the, the husband and wife together consult and decide that, you know, they're going to, you know, whatever their, their decisions are, woman has the right to keep all of her earnings for herself. Um, the idea is the, for the men, it's um, his money is their money, but her money is her money. And that goes, that extends to her and any inheritance that she's ever gotten. Whatever she inherits is for her to keep. The concept that women were able to inherit was pretty monumental in that day and age, because back then women were considered part of the inheritance, where somebody would have a ranch or whatever uh, property they had. A lot of times the woman just kind of went with that. Um, but to give women the right to inheritance, the right to own property, that was revolutionary at that time and really was quite upsetting to the, to the powers at be at the time. And think about the fact that in this country, it is only a couple generations ago that women were allowed to actually have their name on the deed to property or even own, own a business. Um, some of the, one of the other um, rights that women have is a right to participate in government. And there's a lot of examples of that during the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But recently, in more recent history, there are um, nine times that Muslim women in Muslim majority countries have been elected to the head of state. So in Turkey, Pakistan, Senegal, Indonesia, Bangladesh twice, um, Kyrgyzstan, Mauritius, and Kosovo, women have been elected by Muslim majority to heads of state. While in America, women didn't have the right to vote until 1920. So these are some monumental rights that women were granted. Also, the concept of how women should be treated is there is, there is a lot of, there are a lot of hadith and there's a lot of stories in the life of the prophet of how women are supposed to be treated. In um, pre-Islamic times, there was uh, discussions about whether women would even have the right to go to paradise. 
um, or to go to heaven. And in the Quran, it specifically says, and I'll close with these two verses, in um, chapter 3, verse 195, I never fail to reward any worker among you for any work you do, be you male or female. One of you is as the other. And then in chapter um, 4, verse 124, it says, Any believer, male or female, who acts righteously will enter paradise and will not suffer the least bit of injustice. I invite you now to take a few deep cleansing breaths. Re-energizing yourself with the gift of oxygen, opening up your chest, closing your eyes, finding yourself in deeper focus for a moment as you continue to breathe deeply. Let's pray together. Liberating God, 
You who keep vigil with the oppressed, with every being whom injustice seeks to break or push aside. You are the temperature drop before the storm, certain and bold and willing to bring lightning. You are the heat in our anger, the ember that remains in the work of forgiveness, sharp where words soften truth. You are thunder in the throat of prophets, cracking complacent hearts open, impatient, restless, liberating God. You who share fruit with the exploited and remind the powerless of their power, stir our discontent and reveal our courage. Awaken in us an insatiable hunger for what is right. Liberating God, guide us. Light fire in our souls until all bodies and all voices share in your demand for freedom. Amen. This is a song for every girl who been through something she thought she couldn't make it through I sing these words because I was that girl too wanting something better than this but who do I turn to now I'm moving from the darkness into the light
If you are joining us for the first time or have just started getting to know us, welcome. Thank you for being here with us this morning. I recommend that you subscribe to our weekly e-newsletter, Currents. That will have all the latest details on different ways that you can engage with the life of our congregation. You can also head to our website. There you will find our events calendar. Under today's date, there is a Zoom link to a session designed with newcomers in mind called, fittingly, Getting to Know Us. And that starts immediately following the conclusion of this service. It's a great chance to learn more about who we are and what we offer. And you can also um, ask any questions you might have of one of our longtime members, as well as our membership coordinator. Our membership coordinator is Kelly Green. And you can look for her comment under today's welcome message on our public Facebook page. You can also email Kelly at kelly, K-E-L-L-Y, at uucharlotte.org. If you'd like a conversation with a minister, you can tell Kelly that as well, and she'll connect you with me or with my colleague, Jay Leach. Members and guests, in addition to our ongoing virtual programming, we are now offering some socially distanced in-person gatherings. You can read more in Currents about fun around the fire pit here on our grounds every Friday evening. You can also read about a chance to make some art in our parking lot, and there's a whole lot more. You'll need to sign up in advance for each event so we know who's coming. And of course, wear a mask and be mindful of social distancing to help keep us all safe when we're together. If you have been thinking about someone else in this congregation who you miss seeing or you're just wondering how they're doing, why not take an opportunity this week to give them a call or send them a text message. You can even write an old fashioned letter, send it through the mail or pick up the phone and give them a call. Thank you for the support that you show for one another that nurtures this loving community. And in that spirit, I lift up the following people among us who find themselves in times of struggle and celebration. We are sending love to Kathleen Carpenter as her daughter continues to recover from a serious medical condition. We hold in our hearts Kathy Salento as she recovers from a serious surgery. We hold in our prayers Brenda and Lloyd Dillon in this time of their respective ongoing health challenges. We're sending love to Linda Dobson as she continues to have health challenges. We celebrate with Cindy and Mark Fox upon the birth of their grandchild. We hold in our hearts Belinda Perry in this time of her mother's ongoing health challenges. We hold in our prayers Michael and Barbara Searing as Michael recovers from a recent hospitalization. We're sending love to Kate Stroud as she recovers from an illness. We're also celebrating with Kate upon her recent acceptance to graduate school. We celebrate with Carter and Kathleen Utzik and their daughter Megan, who grew up in this congregation, upon the birth of Megan's first child, Carter and Kathleen's first grandchild. We hold in our hearts Carrie Ann Wolf 
as her nephew recovers from recent surgeries and other health challenges. We are also sending love to our members struggling with addiction or who have family members who are struggling with addiction. The added anxiety of the pandemic, the ongoing loss of a once familiar routine, and fewer options for in-person support make navigating this illness still more challenging. Please know that our community holds you with love. I also wanna thank you for your continued financial commitment to this congregation. The payments you make on your pledge or those of you who have started the ritual of generosity each Sunday morning when you see our electronic giving portals pop up on the screen, giving a donation that you might have once put in the offering basket. It's your financial support that makes everything we do possible, and we're incredibly grateful. In her spoken word poem, The Type, Sarah Kay says to women everywhere, 
Do not mistake yourself for a guardian or a muse or a promise or a victim or a snack. You are a woman, skin and bones, veins and nerves, hair and sweat. You are not made out of metaphors, nor apologies. Know that you are the type of woman who is searching for a place to call yours. Let the statues crumble. Be well all and reach out when you need us. Resist.